Hi guys, this is Alicia with Good Morning Sunshine. So today we still have lecture for finals this week. Um, we had four lectures today. We had two on immunology. We went into path intro to pathology and then we had um, production systems for um, beef cows. So I'm going to start with immunology even though they were split up like pathology went in the middle of these but I'm going to do all immunology and then get into pathology and then end with um, production systems for beef. Um, so this was our immunology 5 lecture about acquired immunity so T cells uh, mediated immunity. So our objectives were to explain how T cells recognize antigens on antigen presenting cells so our APCs <clears throat> and then explain the cellular basis of T cell mediated immunity and then understand immune neurological synapses, um, which are interactions of surface re receptors on T cells with um, MHC on antigen presenting cells. So we did um, the first line of defense um, in a sitcom I did last week. Um, now we're on to the second line of defense and the third line of defense. So the second line of defense has to do with neutrophils, macrophages, and dendritic cells. Um, so non specific um, cellular barrier, which is also having to do with innate immunity. But then the third line of defense has to do with B cells and antibodies, which we will be getting into, but we're going to focus on T cells right now and their immunity. So also to note, there is no memory, so no memory storage of antigens, like I talked about in the before lectures, where they can store memory of certain antigens and then the body would be able to recognize um, those pathogens next time, but there is no memory unless there are T or B cells involved. Um, and also T cell activa activation is also dangerous. So also in order for the T cell or the, so you have to, you have the antigen here and then you have the antigen presenting cell. So you need this in order um, to present to the T cell itself. So again, antigen presenting cells or APCs are, we have dendritic cells which can do that, which is our, which are a hundred times better in presenting antigens. They are the best um, cells to do this. But we also have B cells, um, which have dual features. Um, one being their antibody production. It is the only cell that can produce antibodies. So that's very beneficial. Um, and then their second is antigen presenting cells. And then three, we have selected macrophages um, that can also um, antigen present cells. And then we have monocytes and also keratinocytes. So they choose actually very specialized cells in order to be able to do this, in order to present for T cell activation because it is dangerous. Um, so these cells present antigens to T lymphocytes, which are T cells, and then carry class um, 2 MHC uh, molecules. Um, MHC, if you remember, is major histo um, compatibility complex, um, and then release factors, the chemical si signals necessary for T cell activation. So then we have um, the MHC region code. Um, so the MHC region code um, codes for three types of MHC proteins or antigens. So they have, again, class one, which present on all nucleated cells, um, such as birds would have this. Um, class two present on selected cells. And then class three are complement um, components and sex-limited proteins. So class one antigens, um, there's cytotoxic T cells, um, recognize abnormal target cells um, via class 1 antigens, which becomes associated with foreign, so that includes viral, tumor, or bacterial antigens. Um, then we have the genetic regulation of the immune system. So if MHC antigens class 1 or class 2 are high, um, this equals a high immune response. But if um, MHC antigens are low, um, this is a low immune response. So there's three important principles. So the MHC complex is inherited as a block. Um, um, MHC proteins have the highest rate of mutation. So they're constantly creating different amount of um, antibodies in order to match um, different um, pathogens. Um, and then the MHC proteins bind to process antigenic peptides. 
So antigens taken in by the antigen presenting cells, the APCs are chopped into smaller pieces and presented on their surface, so on the usually cell membrane, um, by the MHC proteins um, to the T cells. Um, antigens can be exogenous, which means coming into the body externally, or they can be endogenous, which are they are already existing in the body. So these would be like resident viruses or self antigens, um, but they are processed um, and presented differently. So we're going to start with the processing and presentation of exogenous antigens. Um, the antigen is engulfed and put into a toxic enzyme, like we talked about. Um, it is processed. A process antigen physically combines with a class 2. Um, the whole thing is pushed out to the cell surface, so that's where it's getting presented. And then it's expressed as a processed antigen class 2 um, to the T cell. Um, and then the class 2 interacts with the helper cells. So again, the starting is the same. So we have the antigen here coming in. It gets to the toxic place right here. It's trapped, if you remember me talking about trapping in toxic areas in order to kill antigens. But so it gets chopped up, gets to a toxic place. Um, they see the MHC class and they see this antigen. Um, they bind to it. So the MHC class 2 binds to it and then gets to the cell surface here or the cell membrane and then it is shown to the T cell because it becomes a process antigen class two, so the T cell can now um, see it. Because remember, T cells cannot see antibodies by themselves. Or sorry, antigens, just free um, blowing antigens. Like they don't have that capability like B cells do. Um, so then we're going to get into the processing and presentation of endogenous antigens. Again, these include viral infected cells. Um, so the viral protein here would bind to a class 1, uh, and they interact with the cytotoxic cells. So again, the virus would go in. There's a class 1. The viral um, protein will get into the cell, and then it will come out um, in fragments because it gets, um, gets cut and chopped up. So then the protein fragments, the peptide, comes out, again, attaches to class 1, and then becomes an MHC class 1 associated with the foreign product in order to present um, to the T cell. So then we have lymphocyte structure. Um, it produces lots of proteins. It is located in the blood, um, lymph and lymphoid tissues. Um, it is 5 to 15 um, um in diameter uh, most of the cell contains nucleus so it has a thin rim of cytoplasm containing free ribosomes and mitochondria so here's a image of that and then t cells and b cells look exactly the same under a microscope so most lymphocytes do look alike but they are very diverse in subpopulations um, so then we get into specific immunity, which involves T and B lymphocytes, so T and B cells. Um, so the T cell breaks into a CD4 plus T cell and a CD8 T cell. So normal reference percentages of T cells, T cell subrates CD4 and CD8 and B cells in various species. So we have important T cell surface markers. Um, so T cells actually need two signals in order to activate, to break down the pathogen. So we have the T cell receptor. So that's the ant antigen recognition. So we have alpha, beta, and gamma in the S thing. I always forget what that means. But anyways, through this receptor, it recognizes the antigen um, so then we have CD3 um, for signal transduction, which delivers the signal for activation. And then we have CD4, which is the helper, um, or CD8, which is the cytotoxic helper. And then we have the CD28, which is a co-stimulatory molecule, and then the CD40L, which is a co-stimulatory molecule. These both are the ones that are responsible for the second signal. Um, to give to the T cell in order for the T cell to activate. Um, so then we also have cytokine receptors, which include 
IL, um, IL-2 and INF um, gamma and etc. So again here we have the T cell helper. So the T helper and the T cytotoxic. And then we have the T cell antigen receptor, also known as the TCR. And again, CD28 and CD40L are the ones that give the second signal. So the TH is the helper. This gives the first signal. It's called helpers because they express CD4. Um, they interact with class two. And then we have the CD28 and CD40L, which is the second signal, like I said. And then we have the TC, which is the cytotoxic. Um, they have CD8 instead of CD4, which interacts with class one. So the T cell antigen receptor, I'm gonna get into that. So TCR determines the specificity of T cells. Um, there are so many variable genes. Um, permutation creates billions of versions of antigens, just like I was saying. Um, so yeah, TCR determines the specificity of T cells. Um, for example, like TCR binding to salmonella antigen is different than TCR binding to um, E. coli. So where did T cells develop? T cells come from the bone marrow. Um, the thymus is the primary site for T cell um, development. So we have the stem cells, the bone marrow, um, the thymocytes developing lymphocytes in the thymus. So this is at the immature level. And then T cells are the mature lymphocytes which have immigrated from the thymus to the secondary lympho lymphoid um, organs. So T cells is when they're out of the thymus. Thymocytes are when they're in the thymus. And the thymus has, again, two layers. They have the cortex, which is the most immature immigrants from the bone marrow. And then we have the medulla, which are the um, mature um, thermocytes ready to exit the thymus, or also known as T cells, like I said. Um, so we have T cell selection. Um, the majority of developing T cells die within the thymus. Only those cells that are um, competent leave the thymus. Um, cells that die include defective cells, cells that um, react with self antigens, so negative selection. So those that are um, killing our own cells. And then most of the immigrated T cells, um, this is known as positive selection. However, we can still have those that um, T cells that get out that still react with self antigens. So we have immature cells, um, which means that they have the lack of CD4 or CD8. However, then they become CD4 at a mature level and CD8. But at mature cells, the helper cells have CD4 but do not have CD8. But this, in the cytotoxic cells, don't have CD4 but have CD8. So the immature cells, they are destined to become C T cells. They migrate from the bone marrow to the thymus. And in the thymus, again, they're known as thymocytes um, and are ready for differentiation and mat um, maturation. So ready to get into CD4 and CD8. From there, again, they become CD4 plus T and then CD8 plus T. So we have the helper cells and the cytotoxic cells. Um, the CD4 plus cells go to lymph nodes. So the T cells reside in the paracortex area of the lymph node. And the CD8 plus T cells go to the spleen. Um, so the T cells reside in the peritoneal um, lymphoid sheath. So in PELS in the spleen. Um, T cells development, the prothymocytes. From the bone marrow, migrate to the thymus, like I said. They undergo rigorous development, um, differentiate into the CD4+, plus, and, the, and they don't have CD8 T cells, or they don't have CD4, but they have CD8 T cells. So again, the difference between um, the CD8+, plus is that they're cytotoxic, and then the other ones are helper T cells. And they migrate to spe specific areas in the secondary lymphoid organs, so those include the lymph nodes and the spleen. So then we have T cells are heterogeneous. Um, so CD4 plus is the T helper, like I said. Um, TH1 participates in delayed um, type hypersensitivity, so DTH. It's also primarily secre secretes um, IFN gamma 
in IL-2. So example, why does poison ivy take about 20 hours before it actually shows up? This is because for the delayed type hypersensitivity. So this Th1 is important for intercellular infections. Um, Th2, they help other cells. So they help um, B cells or TC cells. So those are the um, T cells that are cytotoxic um, by um, secreting interleukin. Um, they also primarily secrete um, IL-4 and IL-6 and IL-10. They produce um, certain cytokines and they are important for, um, in extracellular immunity. Then we have TH17. They are for the regulation of inflammatory response. They also primarily secrete IL-17, IL-22, and TNF-alpha. Um, they control um, inflammatory disease. And then we have the T regulatory cells. Um, they're in charge of the regulation of the immune response by suppressing it. They also primarily secrete TGF um, beta. Okay. And then I'm gonna get into the second immunology. So that was just the first lecture of immunology. I know it's a lot to take in. It was a lot for my brain. So now I'm gonna give you the conditions for T cell act um, activation. So T cells do not recognize free antigen like I was talking about. So just the free antigen passing by, they're unable to recognize that. However, B cells have that ability, but T cells do not. So an antigen must be membrane bound. So this is why we have the antigen presenting cells so the T cell can then see it. So, or recognize it. So the recognition state. And then another condition is T cells recognize only processed antigens. So processing takes place in antigen presenting cells. So again, this is why we have the APCs. Um, note that T cells recognize peptide sequence uh, and B cells recognize the shape of the epitope. Again, epitope being something on the antigen, like a piece of the antigen. And then the process antigen, mu uh, th sorry, the third condition is the process antigen must associate with another protein molecule. Um, the major histocompatibility complex, again, the MHC molecules present on the membrane of cells. So again, remember, APC has to, has to be on the membrane in order for the T to see it. So then there um, gives a response. So we're going to get in the processing presentation of um, exogenous antigens again. So that again, the antigen is accounted by an APC. Um, it gets trapped in a toxic bath. Um, the antigen gets chopped, oh, so it gets chopped up and then it gets um, trapped in a toxic toxic bath. The APC has class 2. Um, it moves toward vesicle and enters, a, and enters vesicle and physically binds to the antigen peptide. Um, then it moves it to, towards the surface because remember T cells can only see it on the cell membrane surface. And then the membrane fuse and the antigen peptide is displayed in class 2 um, CD4. So again, the first signal has happened. Remember, CD4 is the first signal. And then when, um, I think it was like um, CD28 and CD40L come in, that's when there's the second um, response or the second um, signal. So what happens when hepatic cells or epithelial cells are infected? Um, these cells do not express MHC class 2. Um, antibodies only deal with extracellular extracellular so they cannot penetrate the cell. So then we're going to get into processing pre presentation of endogenous antigens again, so the viral infected cell. So CD4 on T helper cells is a receptor for class 2 molecule on ABC. CD8 on T cells um, is a receptor for um, class 1 molecules on target cells. So again, the there's a viral protein. It comes in. You have the class 1 cell. So it's coming out, um, gets attached by an MHC class 1, so it, it associates itself with the foreign protein. Um, so the class 1, you have the class 1 and a piece of the viral protein, so the protein fragment. Um, and this leads to, um, so then we have CD8, which is the first signal molecule. Um, and then you want it to get it to the cell surface, so you have a T um, cell receptor um, attaching to the viral protein. So T cells then notice that, they, that there's a chain, 
that there's a change because it's now ba bounded. Um, so it recognizes this change and then it'll activate the T cell in order to start um, killing the antigen. Or I guess the pathogen, sorry. I always get um, antigen and pathogen um, confused, but I guess they're the same thing almost. I did want to look that up because that's where I get really confused. Um, but antigen presenting cells um, secrete interleukin um, 1 or other factors, interleukin 12, um, which are necessary for the activation of T cells, so B7, um, CD80, and 86. Uh, molecule and APC cells will interact with the receptor for B7, CD28, on T cells to provide a co-stimulatory response. This is the second signal I was talking about. So the activation of T cells require, again, at least two signals. First is the primary signal, that is the antigen-specific um, delivered through the TCR-CD complex. And the second co-stimulatory signal is delivered through the membrane interactions of CD28 on T cells with CD80 and 86 on ABC and or CD40L on T cells with CD40 on ABC and or cytokines. So again, in summary, um, interacting molecules of T and APC, T helper interacts with class two, antigen peptide recognizes TCR, binds, that's the first signal. Second signal comes in when there's CD, CD28 and CD40L, T cell will not react if there's not a second signal. So James Allison and Tsuko Honju um, won a Nobel Prize in Medicine for blocking the second um, signal, which stops T-cell activation. Remember how I was saying T-cell activation is dangerous? Well, they got a Nobel Prize for knowing how to stop the second signal. Um, so this led to immunotherapies um, for cancers, autoimmune, and allergies. So rules for T-cell recognition and activation. So this is a summary. So recognition, T-cells don't recognize free floating antigens. Like I said, antigens must be properly presented on T-cells by APCs. Um, antigen must be processed, chopped into small beats. And then the antigens must be membrane bound. Um, processed antigen that is membrane bound must physically associate with MH, uh, MHC class one or class two. So then we have the activation. Um, TCR will now recognize this presented antigen. This is the first signal. Activation of T cells requires second signal or co-stimularity signals. Um, the molecule contacts between T cells and APC are delivered through interactions um, CD28 on T cells with BC molecules on APC and or CD40L on T cells and CD40 on APC. So then we have co-stimulatory cytokines, um, which are secreted by the APC that APC that act on T cells, they, they include the Th1. Um, these are the differentiate cytokines. We have IL-12, it leads to a bias in the clonal expansion of Th1 type cells. We have IL-18 and IL-27. Um, um, Th1 cells are important in immunity against intracellular infections. Um, so viruses, um, things that can get into the cell and live. And also protozoans and also fungus and are also involved in inflammatory conditions. Um, antibodies can't go inside a cell, so absolutely they need the Th or the T helper cell one. So then we have the T helper two, which is the differentiate cytokines. These include IL four and IL ten, which inhibit Th one, and default response is generation of the Th two response. So then we have the Th one response against intracellular pathogens. Um, so antigen taken in by APC gets processed, etc. APC will produce IL twelve. So this is like gonna be really confusing to look at. So again, antigen, the antigen gets, gets taken in. You have the macrophage. Um, and then you have the expression of IL-12, IL-27, or an IL-18. So then you get an MHC TCR interaction going on. Um, interleukin-2 receptor. Um, changes into um, IL-2 that changes into Th1 helper cell. So IL-2 is the growth factor for initial survival and clonal proliferation of T cells. So they make this into a T, um, T helper 1 cell. And then the, there's a bunch of them. And then the T, Th1 cells secrete IFN gamma. Um, they hit the receptor on the edge of the membrane, which is the IFN gamma receptor. And then the IFN 
gamma activates the macrophage and the antibodies bind to the pathogen. And then you have the elimination of the antigen. So then we have Th1 derived cytokines, again, IL IL2, which has to do with T cell growth factor. It is activated by TB, NK, and MAC cells. Um, then we have the interferon gamma. We have to know this. It activates MAX and the na natural killer cells. is critical for immunity against intracellular pathogens. It and it enhances MHC class 1 and 2 molecule, um, so more robust immune system. Then we have Th2 medi mediated immunity against extracellular pathogens. So again, it's basically the same, but B cells are involved in this case. So we have the antigen going in, broken up to bits, goes in the zone, gets eaten, becomes, so produces IL-10 and IL-4 promote Th2, but inhibit Th1. So this, so then you have an MHC-THR interaction, the interleukin-2 receptor becomes IL-2, which makes it into Th2, so T helper 2, um, the Th2 cells in Secrete IL-4, IL-5, IL-6, and IL-10. Um, so the ally 4 promotes B cell functions and suppresses T1 growth. So again, making a lot of B cells there. And then the antibody binds to the antigen and eliminates antigens. So again, we have Th2 derived cytokines, which include the IL-4, which is most important. It stimulates B cells and stimulates T helper 2 and, and it inhibits um, Th1. But we have IL-6, which promotes fever and promotes B-cell functions. We have IL-5, which is a centophil growth and activation factor. Um, it stimulates B, enhances um, IL-4-mediated um, IgE. And then it is important in IgA, mucosal immunity. And then we have IL-10, which inhibits the Th1 responses and promotes um, Th2 and B-cell functions. So we have the cross-regulation of cytokines, the intercellular that have to do with intracellular infections. So we have the T helper CD4 plus precursor leads to a TH1, um, which leads to an IFN gamma. It is important in intracellular infection and its pro-inflammatory effects. So it blocks TH2. Whereas if you have an extracellular infection, so the T helper CD4 plus precursor becomes TH2. TH2 to help um, releases IL-4 blocks Th1 and it's important in extracellular infection is secrete cytokines that promote antibody uh, mediated immunity. So T -pre precursor CD4 plus cells depending upon signals um, can either become Th1 polarized cells or Th2 polarized cells. Um, if T -pre precursor cells become Th1 cells they secrete IFN gamma which um, suppresses Th2 cells therefore favor Th1 cells. But if T precursor becomes Th2 polarized cells, they secrete IL-4, which will inhibit Th1 cell response, therefore favors the Th2 type immunity. So again, we're going to get into Th17 cells. Um, so these are CD4 plus T cells. They are distinct from Th1 and Th2 um, cell subset. Um, differentiation is inhibited by the IFNY gamma and IL-4. Um, and they secrete IL-17 cells. So the functions of the IL-17, so the physiological effects, protective um, in infections, it recruits monocytes and neutrophils, um, it upregulates pro-inflammatory chemokines and cytokines. Um, they, it also has pathological effects, which is an increase in autoimmune diseases, um, RA, and multiple sclerosis. So then we have the regulation of immune response by T regulatory cells. So regulatory cells are heterogeneous cells that are present in low percentages, so 1 to 7% lymphocytes. However, these cells are very powerful in suppressing immune response. So loss of regulatory cells has been shown in laboratory and animals to induce severe autoimmune diseases. Conversely, administration of these cells has been shown to suppress autoimmune diseases. So in a newborn, um, the mother's milk protects it, so it has immune competence. Um, regulatory cells are declined in adults that are aging. So increased incidence of infections would lead to autoimmunity and cancer. Um, regulatory cells may be involved in pregnancy, so local immune suppression, um, to maintain a normal non-autoimmune state. Allergy down um, regulatory, um, so desensitization um, increases regulatory 
Um, we have burns, cancer, and viral diseases. They are increased regulatory cells, which um, dampen immune responses. So we have cytotoxicity by three mechanism mechanisms, which are the granzymes and piriforms, or we have two, which is the tumor necrosis factor, factor beta, and then we have the fast-fast ligand pathway. So I'm going to get into the that. So cytotoxicity, again, has the, the three mechanisms. Um, peripherons are found in granules. They polymerize um, with target cells to form large circular complexes, so the membrane-tac complex, which is also known as MAC. Um, with a hole in the center, granzymes enter through this hole of MAC and trigger um, apoptotic cell death. So that's another way to kill. To kill the antidotes. So that was the end of immunology. So then we got into my favorite, which I've already known stuff about, is clinical pathology. So here we talked about body fluid analysis, so hematology, chemistry, urinalysis, coagulation, which I already know, components of blood. So I'm going to just show you pictures, guys. So, so here, top, we have the blood. Um, it has an anticoagulant in it, so the white buffer contains leukocytes and platelets. So plasma, all good stuff here. So here, up here, we have the blood. These are our red top tubes at work. Um, so we let it just sit, let the blood clot, and then we get serum. Um, but if we use a coagulant, we're gonna get red blood cells on the bottom, we're gonna get the white blood cells and platelets um, for our buffer, and then we're gonna get plasma on top. So again, this blood tube is filled with the blood coagulation cascade activated. Again, think of the red top at work, like I said. So then we have these, but this is our red top at work, our lavender top, which is the whole blood, and then our heparin and citrate. Um, so these all have to deal with plasma, whereas this, the no additive one, has to do um, with serum. So red top, no additive, serum chemistry. Lavender top, EDA, has to do with calcium, do not clot, um, used for hematology. Then we have the green top, which is heparin, um, plasma, and it works with thrombin 3. It doesn't clot used in chemistry, chemistry tests, and then the blue top citrate used for co um, coagulants, so tests for clotting, and so these are known as our coagulation tests. So then we have hematology, which includes the PCV, packed cell volume, um, plasma appearance, and TP. Um, so we use the purple top for all these. And then, yeah. So to for total solids, we need a refractometer, so read this reads on um, protein concentration for the blood. And then we have hematology analyzers, which I use the ProSite at my work. Um, and then we have three layers. Um, so we got into blood smears. Um, so we, ha we have the feathered edge, which is where platelet clumps. Then we have the sweet spot, which is the mono layer, um, which is the base of the mountain. It, um, it does a differential white blood count, um, and we look at morphology of red cells. And then we have the base, that's near the foggy edge of the slide. So we need to know those three layers. So then we got into hepatitis, um, which is the marrow as the site for lymphocytes. And then we got into chemistry methods. So the neutrophil is the most common type. Um, then we got into urine analysis, which we'd also use a refractometer because um, it predicts um, urine-specific gravity, and then we also use a dipstick um, chemical, which it gives us a chemical analysis. And then we do biopsy, tissue versus cell. So here's a tissue biopsy, and here's a cell biopsy. So basically a skin scrape versus a FNA, um, which is a fine needle aspirate. That's what FNA stands for. And then we have interpreting test results. So we have the reference population, so the reference sample group. Then we have the reference distribution. Um, the middle is 95%. And then we have the clinically healthy animals. So one test equals five chance out, five tests equals 23 chance out, and then 20 tests equals 64 chance out. So then we have refer reference intervals. So the third standard deviation. So as long as something's within three standard deviation, it is probably normal 
However, if it's outside of this, it's probably um, significant. So reference interval variables depends on species, breed, age, sex, texting method, and geographical region. And then we have analytical test performance, which has to do with precision. So we have the analytical precision, ability to get the same result. We have analytical accuracy, which closeness to the true value. We have the analytical specificity, um, which is the ability to detect only the substrate substance of interest. So anal analytical does not mean diagnostic. So then we have diagnostic test performance. So we have diagnostic um, sensitivities, frequency of the test um, in disease, and then we have the diagnostic specificity, so the frequency of the test in disease, and then we have the diagnostic accuracy, which is the frequency of the correct classification, so it varies with the um, threshold. So that was the end of that, and lastly we have cows, so production system. So beef cattle, there's about 95 million in the U.S., so 31.8 million beef cows, there's 631,000 in Virginia, 31.1 million steers and heifers that are over 500 pounds, and then we have 33.7 uh, million head harvested in 2018. Um, the harvest live weight um, was 1345, um, so 11 to 14 percent of beef is exported. Um, it's concentrated in the Midwest, a good number in the East, um, and we are the supplier to the Midwest usually. So we have our Black Angus cows, so that we have to know all these different cows. Black Angus, did you know Angus also comes in red, but since they're not black, um, farmers usually don't go with them. And then we have the Herefords here. Um, they have white heads and red bodies, conquered the West, can survive harsh conditions, used to be prominent, but they aren't black, so they were discouraged. We have the Black Baldy, which is Angus bred for, which is Angus um, bred with a Hereford. Um, they outperform the purebreds. And then we have the Belted Galloway, which is English. This is our Oreo cow. Um, they have a smaller frame. They are hardy cows, and they're from Scotland. Then we have Continental cows, so that means they're on the European continent. We have the Cherilas. Um, they are horned, but they have been removed. They are white, large framed, very heavy muscled, good meat animal, and it originated from France. Then we have the cemental, which it originated in Switzerland. Um, it comes in a variety of colors. They are large frame, wider head with curl um, for hair on their head. Then we have the lumison, which is a French breed, coming red and black. And then we have zebus. Um, this is known as a Brahma. They come in a variety of colors. They have a hump on their back. Um, they are large pendulous sheaths. They have droopy ears, do well in hot climates, and teak and heat, heat resistance, and don't do well in the cold. So our beef cattle, we have cow-calf, um, we have growers, and we have feedlots. So I'm going to talk about cow-calf um, operations. Um, so produce, producers breed cows, deliver, and raise calves. Um, typical product is a weaned calf. Um, typically, cow-calf producers are small operators, especially in the east. Their average herd size is 20 cows. Um, out west, herds are larger. Um, but a business in order to run needs about 300 plus cows. So reproduction is generated by natural service, that's 70%. So, so bulls um, do the breeding versus artis artificial insemination um, in commercial cow-calf operations. Um, so we have cow-calf, and we're going to talk about bulls. Um, the turnover about every three years for bulls, um, they have a um, typically purchased rather than reared on the farm. Um, the main chain is to purchase a bull for one to two years of age. Um, birds turned in with cows at a rate of one to 12 or to 1 to 50. Rule is 1 to 30 cows or 3 bulls per 100 cows. Bull purchase is a way to introduce new genetic uh, material into herds and about 9% of beef cattle are um, artificially inseminated, so not much. Then we have the breeding season for cow calves. Um, to have an animal is 12 months. The breeding season, so the goal of the cow calves on the same day every year, um, begins when bulls are turned in with cows at about 80 days after the beginning of the calving season. So 80 plus 285 gestation equals 365 days, which is one year, 12 months. Um, typical length of a breeding season is 60 days. So only 60 day calving season then. Um, open cows results in economic loss as they must be cooled or replaced or maintained for a year with no production. Um, so if they don't get pregnant, they usually go to the market. Um, so cow calf birth, um, birth, they're usually weighing about 60 to 120 pounds. An average is about 80 pounds. Um, a heifer calf or bull calf. 
Um, usually there is a calving season during which the calves will be born. Um, only poorly managed herds in moderate climate areas tend to practice the year-round calving. So again, we're getting to the calving season of cow calf. Um, calving season time is chosen either so that um, non-lactating cows are maintaining during least favorable conditions um, or spring calving, um, which is February to March, um, so they're bred in May and June, or two, so that late nursing, now grazing calves, can take advantage of the high quality forages. So this is in the fall, calving August and September, bred in January and February. Um, in Virginia, spring calving in the Mountain Valley regions, fall calving is um, in the Piedmont region. So then we're going to get into cow calf. So the baby male calf is called a bull calf and the female is called a heifer. Um, bull calves usually ca castrated at days to months of age. Um, this is steer with different behavior and carcass um, characteristics at slaughter. So more fat deposit and muscle. Nursing calves stay with cows increasingly eat forage at the site of dams um, with increasing age. Creep feeding to exclude cows with concentrates may be pr um, practiced in some settings. So then we get into weaning, full weaning at 5 to 10, average 5 to 6 months of age. Weaning often um, accompanies marketing or at least significant change in management. Stimulus to wean is 1, being marketing opportunity, 2, being changing nutritional conditions so calf growth or cow nutrition would suffer from continued nursing, or 3, need to give the cow a dry, non-lactating period before the next um, partition. So weaned cows, they're marketed steers or heifers. Um, kept as replacements, uh, marketed through stockyard, accumulate for so stockyard being accumulate for sale or direct and telemarketing buyer contract. So replacement heifers, um, replacements produce at the average rate of 15% of a herd per year. The small herds have very um, sporadic programs. Um, goal is to have heifers, heifer calf at two years of age. Um, growth from weaning to breeding must be substantial so that puberty and breeding has occurred by 15 months of age. Um, the target is two out of three of mature weight, two thirds of mature weight. So cow-calf operations. Cow-calf operations are primarily, primarily forage-based um, by low economic returns and expensive concentrates. Forages graze from pastures with a wide variety of plants, but generally classified as grasses or um, forbs and, and is preferred method um, for providing forages because of cost. Um, pasture stocking rates um, from a few per acre in productive areas to less than one per section, a square mile in arid areas, um, two acres um, per cow-calf um, pair in mid-Atlantic region. Um, harvest forages are fed when forages aren't available due to the climate periods or low or no pasture growth or availability, uh, most often as dry hay, but sometimes as haylage. Um, round bale is about seven, 100 to 900 pounds, and then 40, 50 pound block of hay. Then we have housing. Housing is usually in pastures or wintering outside lots, um, rarely housing during very severe winter conditions or temporary at calving. So then we have beef cattle production, which is a grower. So add additional pounds to the calf, prepare calf to eat on their own, um, get their immun immunologically prepared to go to a feed lot. So they may be loosely divided into backgrounders, stalkers, and weaners. Um, take calves produced by cow-calf segment and add additional pounds. Again, prepare calves for next phase physiologically and health-wise. And then group calves to better fit next phase. So grower operations, we have the backgrounders, which um, is the concept is giving calves a background after leaving the cow to prepare them for a, a successful life in the feedlot. Um, rations tend to mix of harvest forages and concentration or concentrates designed for maintenance plus gains, moderate growth, and high growth. Housing tends to be more intensive, dry lots or barns. Economic usually dictates at least a moderate amount of um, weight gain. So the backgrounders tend to own animals one to three months. They are located where calves are produced if feedstuffs are available. Adjacent to feedlots, um, owners may retain calves and perform this function rather than selling calves to another party. Then we have the stalker operators, which are grazers who capitalize on economic gains of wing calves, must utilize high quality pastures, housing tends to be expensive, um, tend to own um, animals a full gra grazing season. Um, they are located at high rainfall mountains, lots of grass and wheat pastures. Then we have weaners, they perform um, function of getting calves through the stress of weaning and adjustment to eating harvested um, forages. Tends to be in contact function for feedlots, newer type of operation, tend to have possession of animals for weeks only, house calves and loosely confined um, weaning pens. They are located near feedlots. 
Then we have the beef um, cattle production. Um, feedlots is the final phase for mainstream beef production. Concentrated animal feeding operations are very large, very specialized businesses. Increasingly integrated, one owner for, for feedlot, trucking, feed mill, slaughter facility, um, and meat um, purveying structure. So cattle numbers are in between from thousands to a hundred thousands. On um, the feedlot, um, goal is to gain weight, so fat, concentrate based on rations, often 70 to 90% concentrate per grain. Forage is needed for adaption to concentrates and depending on room and health. Um, prefer to buy heifers at 700 pounds, steers at 800 pounds, and calves less than a year, short yearlings or long yearlings. Um, weight gains of two and a half pounds to four pounds per day. Feed cattle to meet most economical slaughter parameters, then remove for slaughter. Typical feeding period for three to six months. Estimate slaughter parameters visually by how fat or by ultrasound. Um, typically weighs about 1,000 to 1,500 pounds. Ideal is 1,100 to 1,350. Average age is about 16 to 20 months. So then we have feedlot location, um, high plains states, 50% of all fed in Texas, Kansas, and Nebraska. Uh, moderate temperatures with low rainfall allows dry lots versus barns or concrete lots. So slaughterhouses located adjacent to feedlots, cheap transportation for grain and cattle, custom feed yards. And then feedlot to slaughter, slaughter by packers. So large corporations, three major, that you have GBS, Tyson, and Cargill. Um, slaughter for the process, market efficient and powerful. So then marketing is usually occurs three to five days after slaughter. So lots of information today that I have to go over before finals. We have to know all that information for finals. So I wish me luck. And I'll, we have six lectures tomorrow. So that's going to be a long video as well. Sorry, um, it was kind of boring today. Um, but I love you guys. And I thank you guys for watching.